Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are located on this gorgeous and mysterious planet. We're going to start in just a sec. So grab your cup of coffee, grab your paper pen, uh, fire up a new Word doc if you want to take notes, because we're going to start in just a sec. So give everybody a chance to settle in briefly. And here we go. All right. So I'm Christine Comerford. Welcome to the Neuroscience of Navigating Change. We're going to talk today about three proven tools to boost change agility. And what is change agility? Well, change agility is the ability to choose your emotional state inside regardless of what's happening outside. Change agility is the ability to be able to pivot, to adjust, to adapt to whatever is happening outside. Change ability, agility is the ability to be able to look out at the world, see what's coming, and create strategies, create plans so that you don't get blindsided. So there are internal and external aspects of change agility. But first, we have to make sure that we are agile inside as leaders so we can lead others to be agile as well. So let's look at, at kind of what this is going to look like for you and these proven tools, and then we're going to dive right on in. So you guys probably know pretty much about who I am. What we do at Smart Tribes Institute is we do leadership and culture coaching, and then we work on workshops on change agility, on neuroscience of leadership, neuroscience of influence, neuroscience of the optimal teams, neuroscience of navigating change. We use a lot of these neuroscience tools to boost sales and marketing as well. So let's go ahead and when we look at these tools today, I want to stress that these tools are based on neuroscience, but they're also based on deep operational expertise. We are not a bunch of PhDs. We're actually a bunch of business practitioners who've had P&L responsibility, who have hired and fired people, who have launched projects, who have built and sold companies. So these are really pragmatic tools that have been used in the trenches when the grenades are flying, okay? And when times are good as well. We use these tools with a ton of different companies, all different shapes and sizes, all over the, com the country, all over the world, and also in all different industries. So these things are really versatile. Why do we need to be agile in times of change? Well, because we want to grow. And many of you are probably familiar with our inflections point chart. And what's interesting about this chart is that as we build to the next revenue inflection point, we have a different company. And those of you who have read our first book, Smart Tribes, have noticed that the people stuff changes, the money stuff changes, and the business model stuff changes. So growth is going to require and generate change. So let's just take that as a given, which is why these tools are so helpful. Great. So let's now talk about what inflection point, take a moment, what inflection point are you headed to next? And if you're over 500 million, awesome. Things get a little more complex and customized. That's why we don't have a chart for that. And if you're under 10, when you first get to five, there's a lot of change there. And look at all the things you need to do to get to 10. So let's now, knowing that change is a constant, knowing that change is faster than ever before, let's get some tools. So as I mentioned, we're going to learn three tools to boost your experience of change agility, to make you more agile as a leader. So the purple circles are your solo resilience, the resilience that you build up yourself. And then the green circles are the tools that you bring to your people. All of these tools are covered in our new book, Power Your Tribe. So for starters, today we're going to look at releasing resistance. We're going to look at making new meaning. No matter what happens to you, choosing how you want to hold it, and then enrolling and engaging others. We teach a full day class on this, a full day workshop, if you want to learn more about this. But let's just give you some starters. So first, the brain. This is an artistic rendering. This is not physiologically accurate. What I want you guys to look at here, though, is in leadership, there are three primary areas of the brain. We follow the triune brain theory. And those are reptilian, mammalian, and neocortex. The reptilian brain, if it could speak, it would say dead or not. Reptilian brain, stimulus response machine, coded for safety, no understanding of quality of life. Mammalian brain is next. 
Now, the mammalian brain is where we have the limbic system. Now, the limbic system does overlap multiple areas of the brain. But let's just say for now, the bulk of the limbic system, the fight, flight, freeze response, is in the mammalian brain. The mammalian brain, if it could speak, it would say friend or foe. Still, a stimulus response machine coded for safety. More around emotional safety, a little bit more. Still a little concerned with physical safety like the reptilian brain is. Next, neocortex. Prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead is within the neocortex. This is the most evolved uh, aspect of being a human being. The prefrontal cortex is where we have thinking, planning. I'm here, but I want to be there. Um, problem solving, language skills, tool making, decisions. If the prefrontal cortex could speak, it would say, what can I create? A little more interesting than dead or not and friend or foe. But what happens? When we're in change, when we're in any sort of stressful situation, we slide into what we call critter state. Critter state is where we're like a little critter, a little animal, safe or not, dead or not, fight, flight, freeze, friend or foe, etc. Notice that in critter state, the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex is offline. What we're going to do today is as we learn these tools and as we use these tools, we're going to help people get in and stay in what we call the smart state where you have access to all three parts of your brain, no matter what's going on outside, you can choose your emotional state. When you choose your emotional state, you have greater agility. Because we now know from Carnegie Mellon, NYU, Stanford, Harvard, UCLA, MIT, that 90% of our decisions, 90% of our behaviors are driven, are dominated by our emotional brain. So today we're gonna to use our 10%, to understand how to navigate our 90%, right? The more people that we have in their smart state, the more we have what's called a smart tribe at your company, in your department or division. Smart tribe, fantastic results, needless to say. These results are based on over a thousand companies over the past 30 years. So let's go. It's time for tool number one. When we're in change scenarios, when we are in stress, we are often resisting. Ooh, I don't want to have this experience. So the stress of change is happening. You could actually fill this blank in with anything you want. The stress of blank, the discomfort around blank. And think of it this way. We have two paths. The first path is the critter state path. There's, there's some change. There's some stress of some sort. Ah. I'm resisting it, then I get frustrated. I don't want this to be happening. Why is this happening? Then maybe you get angry. Then you dismiss those new ideas. You dismiss that change. You reject it. There's no momentum here. That's the problem with the first path, right? It's just about resisting and trying to hold the bad stuff back, but there's no momentum. There's no ability to go forward because we're putting so much energy into resistance. The second path stress of change, stress of whatever, and we go, wow, I'm feeling really stressed. Whew, I'm feeling frustrated or overwhelmed or whatever is true. Huh. Notice the pause, right? Notice the ability to pause, check our emotional state, say, consent to it, wow, I'm feeling this, and then, huh, I wonder why I'm feeling this. Now we get into curiosity. We start to ask questions. We start to inquire. I wonder why this is happening. I wonder how I could see this differently. I wonder what the benefits might be of this. I wonder how I could use this for growth. I wonder, and we start asking questions. That then creates prefrontal cortex, open-mindedness, and a new perspective versus critter state and uh, reptilian mammalian brain lockdown. Limbic system override is the first path. Ah, fight, flight, freeze. The second path is, huh, curiosity, insights, new perspective, and now we can embrace change. Let me give you an example of something that just happened recently to us. Uh, we were talking to a candidate, and we received this email. We had critiqued his work. We received this email for one of the roles um, at our company. We received an email and it seemed a little bit kind of defensive and, and snarky and a little arrogant. 
Um, we could have said, ah, this person is arrogant. Wow, we could have taken it personally, which is usually what, if you're ever wondering why you get into critter state, really often it's because you're taking stuff personally. So we could say, ah, I don't like this guy. I feel frustrated. I feel angry. Forget it. We're not going to use that candidate. We're not going to go forward. Or we could say, huh, wow, I'm feeling a little offended by this email. Huh. What is it that's offending me here? I wonder what he may have meant. And we start getting curious and we start getting open-minded and we start going, I wonder what he was experiencing. Maybe the critique really kind of pushed his ego buttons. And then we start to say, huh, <clears throat> can I separate the person from the behavior? You know that you're in your smart state when you're not taking something personally and when you can separate the human from their behavior. Humans are essentially good in my experience. Behaviors work or they don't. And here's the tricky thing with behaviors. A behavior that may have worked in the past sometimes doesn't work anymore. So I want us to start to look at the difference between resistance and consent. Consent isn't saying it's okay. Consent is simply saying it is. It's being present to it. Start to think about your questions. We're gonna do a question and answer um, section in just a minute. So here's the thing. Think back to the example of the email that had the experience, that gave us the experience of arrogance and condescension. We are creating meaning. So visual, auditory, kinesthetic input, an email, something somebody says to you, whatever comes into your uh, reptilian brain, your brainstem, see item number one, the information comes in, it's then passed to the mammalian brain where we get the emotions attached to whatever that feeling was. Ooh. I feel offended. Then we go to the prefrontal cortex where you make meaning. This guy is arrogant. He hurt my feelings. It's all just a story. Shakespeare was right. Nothing is good or bad. Only thinking makes it so. He was talking exactly about meaning making. Human beings are little meaning making machines. Here's the trick. The meaning that we make determines our beliefs, right? He doesn't value me. He's a jerk, okay? It determines our identity. I am not being respected here. It determines then our behavior. I will dismiss this person. And it determines or limits our capabilities. So I want us to start to really unpack why people do what they do. And this, my friend, is how it all happens. The data comes in, the sensory data comes in, Emotions are attached to it and meaning is made. Let's go into some examples. Today in San Francisco, it's cold and rainy. <laughs> do we say, ah, it's cold and raining. Ah, this is so bad. Or we do go, do we say, yay, this is awesome. It's going to fill up the reservoirs and the plants are super psyched. Our dog, when he gets a bath, he used to be, I hate baths. Now he jumps right into the shower stall because he has realized that he's going to get some treats and we actually make it a fun experience. The experience is the same, having a bath, dealing with the rain. The difference is the feeling, which is based on the meaning that we make. Feels good or feels bad? You decide. This is how powerful you are. So if something's happening outside of you, Maybe the market is down. Maybe you just lost a big customer. You can go, oh, boo, and get into that critter state. Or you can say, huh, okay, this is not fun. This is a little painful. And what can we learn from this? What could we have done differently? What could we do different next time? Now, let's look at internal uh, meaning making. So here is Joe. He's starting a new job, all right? And his boss is writing up on the, the uh, whiteboard. Now, what's happening inside Joe? He could either be saying, oh my gosh, loading up the visual auditory kinesthetic experiences back in his brainstem of a memory of a teacher who maybe always called on him when he didn't have the answer. So he might be saying, uh-oh, woman of authority writing stuff on a board, yikes. Uh-oh, I'm just gonna get small. She's gonna think I'm an idiot. Or if he had good information that he loaded up, positive past experience. This is great. I'm going to get this down in no time. As we start to understand external meaning making and internal meaning making, we can then start to reframe. 
questions coming up in a sec. When we change the story about what's happening, we change the meaning. It's good or it's bad. We change the feeling. Feels good, feels bad, and we change the behavior. Check this out. A young woman came to me a little while ago and said, it's really hard getting a job fresh out of college these days. I said, is it? I wanted to say, if you say so, because that's the meaning she was making. We spent some time working on it, and we actually worked on a reframe, which is, it's awesome that there are a lot of people job hunting right now. It gives a person the opportunity to really bring their A game to stand out. She had been looking for a job for months because that initial meaning making was, it's going to be hard, and so surprised it was. Once she did the reframe, she got a job within a few weeks. So how are we telling our people to feel? Type your questions, please, into the chat box. Are we telling people it's going to be hard? Because if we tell them it's going to be hard, it's going to be hard. Or we tell them it's going to be easy. Are we telling ourselves it's going to be hard or it's going to be easy? The feeling is what you say it is. Buddhists say that everything is an illusion. So I figure if everything is an illusion, let's pick one that's useful. <laughs> let's pick one that's empowering. Alexis Chapman is here. Tammy uh, Spence is behind the scenes holding down the fort. Thank you both for being here from the Smart Tribes team. Alexis, let's ask some questions. What do we have? All right. So everyone, if you could just enter your questions into the chat box, and then we'll be able to see them and ask Christine. But the first question we have is from James. And he says, reframing seems like a mind game, like taking a negative situation and tricking yourself to be positive. I can see it work for a moment. How, you know, how can you make this approach real and enduring? Okay, I wanted to make sure I got the name right. What was the name again? James. Jane, okay. Uh, I thought it was, I wasn't sure if it was female or male. Okay, Jane. Um, male, James. James. A -M -E -S. <laughs> okay, Sorry. thank you. What, yeah, I didn't want to say, hey, Jane, if it's James, or vice versa. Okay, James, um, thank you for this question. Um, here's the thing, um, and we do this a lot in our leadership coaching that we do, um, a lot. Um, it's a learned process to look at the outcome that you want to create. We have all been socialized um, from cave person days to look at the problem. That's how we have survived. So our default often is to look at the problem. It is a learned behavior to start to now look at the outcome. And we're going to do that in just a couple of minutes. So the reptilian part of us wants us to survive and stay not dead. So we look at the problem. The mammalian wants us to fit in. So we don't want to rattle the cage. So if everybody else is feeling scared, we're going to feel scared too. As we build our brand, James, awesome opportunity for you. As we build our brand as the person that is looking at the outcome, acknowledging the problem. So we don't want to mind game, right? We acknowledge the problem. Yeah, there's a problem here. And now what would we like? Because the what would we like is going to get us into some momentum. Um, we want to create the momentum. We don't want to be mired in the problem. In just a minute after the Q&A, we're going to go into our second tool, which is going to help you shift your focus. So if you want to be establishing your brand as the person, James, that helps people have insights and helps people aspire, two very important things that we need to do at work. The third thing that we need to do at work besides have insights and aspire to that glorious future is achievement. If you look at the latest neuroscience research, I just was at the symposium last fall, Achievement actually leads to happiness at work. You don't want happiness first. Achievement actually is the precursor to happiness. So James, I encourage you to use the tool coming up, the outcome frame, to start to build your brand as the person that creates insights in other people's brains. Thank you. Great, we have two more questions and you touched, um, your last answer touched on these, but from Kim, how to handle when you have presented the change in a positive light, but they are still negative about it. That's from Kim. Okay. Uh, presented in a positive light. Say but the receiver, um, it's, she said how to handle when you have presented the change in a positive light, but they are still negative about it. Ah, good. Okay. Thank you, Kim. 
so I would find out what they're negative about. Maybe there's three things. Well, it's cost too much and it's too hard and it's whatever. Ask them of those things that they are negative about, which one is most painful, okay? And then say, great, what's the opposite of that? Um, it's gonna be too hard to do. Um, so what would that, so what would you like around that? Well, I would like for it to be easier to do. Great, what will having that do for you? So we're gonna go into the outcome frame. So Kim, take the most negative, um, response you get and then ask them what the positive alternative would be what would be the opposite of that and then walk them through because sometimes when we are asked what we would like we talk about negative stuff well i don't want it to be so hard and i don't want it to be so expensive and i don't want it to take so much time great which one of those three is the worst oh taking so much time so what would you like there well i'd like for it to take less time ah good okay now we can do an outcome frame on that so stay tuned for just a sec, Kim, because we're going to do an outcome frame on that. We use the outcome frame all the time in coaching, in pulling um, cultures together, and in getting stronger sales and marketing. We had one more because we have to go through a couple more tools. Yes, uh, and this is from Whitney. Whitney asks, when you are in the midst of conflict and are really heated, how do you switch gears when you're upset? Uh, okay, Whitney. So you're in the middle of conflict. You're, you're super heated. This is when you want to stop and ask yourself how you're feeling, okay? <sighs> okay, I'm heated. What does heated mean, Whitney? Does it mean I'm angry? Does it mean I'm offended? Does it mean I'm feeling vengeful? First, stop and get curious. The number one thing I want you to do, Whitney, is stop and get curious. Get curious about your own experience and get curious about the meaning that you're making. They're not valuing me. Um, I'm not appreciated, okay? Then, when you have that meaning that you're making, ask the next, the following questions. Is this true? Yeah, it's true, I feel this way. Okay, is this true all the time? Well, no. <laughs> How does it make you feel? Ah, lousy. Okay, turn it around. This is from Byron Katie. The turn it around's the hardest part. Um, they're being mean to me. I'm being mean to me. They're being mean to them. We have to get some distance so you can choose your behavior. So step one is get the curiosity so you then have some possibility of choice. And again, the outcome frame is gonna help you get some curiosity coming up. Thank you. Oh, Whitney, you know what? One more thing um, I wanna say to Whitney is um, we have to do a parasympathetic sympathetic reset. And when our sympathetic nervous system is like, Arr! it's very helpful. We're usually breathing through our mouth when we're in critter state. Our focus is narrow, our blood is in our large muscle groups, and we're breathing through our mouth, okay? <laughs> okay, like you see dogs do. What we wanna do is start to breathe through our nose. If we can breathe through our nose for seven, count of seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, hold for seven. Exhale through the mouth for seven. In for seven, hold through seven, exhale through mouth for seven. If we do seven of those, seriously, or more if you need it, it is a great way, Whitney, to reset your parasympathetic, rest and digest. Rest and digest is the parasympathetic. Fight, flight, freeze is the sympathetic. When we do that cycle of breathing, it really helps us reset. All right, so how do we consent? Look at the emotion wheel, please. Everybody is going to use this. Okay, James will use this. Kim will use this. Whitney will use this. We look at the emotion wheel. If you just want to go right into the middle, I'm mad, sad, or scared, or I'm peaceful, powerful, joyful, or I'm mad and I want to feel powerful instead, or I want to feel peaceful. And then, of course, all the ones that um, branch out are just kind of more detailed versions. The kind of core root emotions are in the beginning and that are in the center. So first, Grr, I don't want this. What's the emotion that you're resisting? Then, okay, whew, here I'm experiencing this. I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling insecure. I'm feeling helpless, whatever. I don't want to be this. It's okay. Get present to it first. Now, next, and what would we like? So I want us to get present to that. We're going to do the outcome frame in one second, the what would we like? If we want our revenue to boost, if we want our profitability rapidly growing, if we want a culture that's rich, honest, thriving, performing at unparalleled levels, we must create the ability to be agile. And emotionally agile is so important. So 
shift number two, okay? Shift focus to be on the outcome that you want. So we have gotten present with what we're experiencing, okay? We are now um, looking at what we would like instead, and we're gonna go through the series of questions. What would you like? It's a positive outcome you can create and maintain. What will having that do for you? Benefits and how you'll feel. When you're in critter state, Whitney, James, Kim, everybody, you can sit down and do an outcome frame. You can always say, hey, you know what? I'll get back to you later on that if you're super triggered, right? Go into your office, do an outcome frame. You wanna do this outcome frame, please ideally for 15 minutes. When you do it for 15 minutes, you load up the visual auditory kinesthetic structures. Remember the picture before, right? Of stuff coming into your reptilian brain, sensory information. As we load up the visual auditory kinesthetic structures of that desired state, the outcome that we want, our creature neurology, our reptilian mammalian brain goes, oh, I could actually have this. <laughs> so we need to make sure that we do it for a good juicy amount of time. And I find 15 minutes is always safe. Some people can get there in seven. Some people can get there in 10. 15 is a sure thing. What would you like? Positive outcome you create and maintain. I'll show you an example in a sec. What will having that do for you? Benefits and how you'll feel. How will you know when you have it? What sort of proof is going to show up? And then what a value might you risk or lose? This is the ego question. Might not feel as appreciated if I help my people shine. Um, if I get out of the weeds I, and do more strategic work, uh, I might not feel as important. What are your next steps? Get into action. This is a short outcome frame. You can get a really rich experience here. So let's do a sample. What would you like? Maybe you are resisting a bunch of low value activities, a bunch of administrative work. Ah, I want more strategic time. Okay, what will have that do for you? Feel more engaged, feel more energized, like I'm really making a difference to the business, feel more powerful, be more happy, sleep better at night, have a happier home life. How will you know when you have it? Notice how detailed this is. This is now starting to step into that desired state. Okay, we need to step into that desired state so our brain believes we can have it. When I spend two hours or more each week on strategy and visioning, when I cut the number of meetings I attend by 25%, when my direct reports are at leadership level five or greater. All right, this is becoming more real. What a value might you risk or lose? Ugh, I might initially feel a little less important might feel a little less involved in minutia, might have to let go of some control, might have to risk the, resist the temptation to rescue people. Can't do it. You can't rescue them if you want to empower them. Um, might have to invest time in cultivating my directs more powerfully. All right, there's some trade-offs, right? To get what I want, I'm going to have to be okay with these trade-offs, with the risk or the side effects. What are your next steps? Set up recurring strategic time in my calendar and one-on-ones to offload some work, build leadership, determine which means to skip, et cetera. So we went from, Rarrr, I don't like doing all these low value activities, grr. Okay, how am I feeling? Oh, I'm feeling irritated, overwhelmed, upset. Okay, what would I like? Well, I'd like more strategic time. Great. Whew. Go through the process of the outcome frame. Outcome frames are awesome to use in groups. Outcome frames are awesome to use in sales calls. One of our clients launched a product. The product didn't work that well, wasn't super well uh, adopted by the market. CEO, he got the team together and said, okay, you guys, we don't need to focus on the problem any longer. It's not working. We get that. We're frustrated. <sighs> okay, let's just be present to that. What would we like? Well, we would like you know, for the product to be a success. And he went through a nice, juicy outcome frame. He did about 20, 25 minutes on it. And my favorite stuff was everybody really got present to what a, a value they might risk or lose. They all chipped in for the next steps. And now we fast forward four months. <sighs> the product is working. <laughs> the customers are buying it. Yay. An outcome frame is great to do. Back to James, to shift the state of your team. Okay? To shift the state of yourself. Um, to shift the state of somebody in your personal life. Now, Conframe is super effective for that, okay? When we use the outcome frame, we help people take greater ownership. 
we help people become more engaged because they're engaged in the outcome that they are creating. Get ready for some questions about the outcome frame. We help them step into more strategic time. The outcome frame helps pull us into our prefrontal cortex. We're back here going, Rawr, I don't want this. And this helps us envision the future that we do want to create. It helps us get more clarity. It helps us get more focus and more accountability. Think about the next steps. That's going to help us create that desired state that we want. So if we want our team at a whole new level, if we want the energizing experience of the outcome frame where we actually step into and bask, which is why I said 15 minutes, bask in that glorious future, then we will find that when we take people there, whether it's a sales prospect, a team member, an aging parent, a kid who doesn't want to do their homework, um, a colleague, um, a peer, a direct report, your boss, it creates insights, it creates aspiration and desire for that new state, that desired state, and it also creates an experience of achievement, of what it's going to be like when we achieve that desired state. Questions. We're now looking at how we take reframing and we do a more sophisticated version of reframing using the outcome frame so that we don't feel like it's a mind game. It's actually a process that we guide people through and we have to first consent instead of resist to get there. Questions. We have a question from Alex, and he asked this, he or she asked this earlier, um, and it's a bit of a long one. So okay. Alex says, I work for a company that is in a growth period. I've been working with the owners of my company to implement the practices you are teaching as they have told me they want to move into move me into a more leadership role. However, it's been a year since that, and it seems or feels like the changes are not going to be put into place and actually practiced. They are afraid of change. I know these organization changes will help and transform the overall mood of the office. I am trying to stay positive about this to stick through with the company. Is this a move or responsibility of mine to decide to move in onto a new opportunity, or should I continue to challenge myself and hope the rest gets picked up or change my environment to a new place that might actually be accepting of my change and growth? Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alexis, because that was a whopper. And thank you, Alex. Um, so, so let's look at this. First of all, Alex, to me, this is an opportunity in what we would call leadership Olympics. <laughs> so, were it me, and I don't know everything that you've tried, I wouldn't give up quite yet because if you do decide to move to a different company, a different opportunity, it would be cool to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know what, I tried everything and they weren't ready for this. So if you feel like you've tried everything, you know, go ahead and find a greener pasture. But I think there's one more opportunity for you, which I think would be cool. Um, have you found out what they most care about? How do they get their bonuses? The leaders that you most need to engage and enroll, seriously, how do they get their bonuses? Probably top line growth, you know, bottom line growth, employee engagement, you know, uh, employee retention, right? What is it that helps them get their bonuses? In a couple of minutes, we're going to do an SBM index. I would love for you to spearhead one within your company. It would be super awesome. So we find out how they get their bonuses, what they are most committed to, what actually puts money in their pocket. Then we actually shape the change initiatives because they, do, they will support, it's true, they will support, but we have to sell it. We have to explain how these different initiatives will ensure or support their getting their particular bonuses and outcomes that they want. So do they crave safety or belonging or mattering, which we're going to get to in a sec. So I want you to really pay attention to the next section, Alex, because you're going to use these tools. And then if somebody really wants to matter in the company and mattering means that they're going to get their bonus or whatever, we sell these change initiatives in a way that will ensure that they matter. You know, I really see you as a thought leader. This would take the company to a whole new level, et cetera. So 
if we feel that we've used the Smart Tribes tools to sell the Smart Tribes and Power Your Tribes tools, great. But to me, it looks like you could possibly experience, and we, you could just, if you, if you go to our site, you can just get a, a one-off coaching session if you want, and we could hammer this out in a coaching session. But I think that we have an opportunity to tie the tools to the different revenue inflection points and to help them see, and you can see that, that table right in Smart Tribes, help them see how our tools are going to help them get that and find out what revenue inflection point they're focused on. And then you can reach out to us, and we can have a coaching session or two to help you craft it. Because the meaning of the communication is the message received. I'm not entirely sure that they have received a message in the words that they are ready to hear. So I would look at Smart Tribes, Chapter 6 and 7, Power Your Tribe, Chapter 7, and make sure that we're using the meta programs and safety belonging mattering. Seriously. Then I would walk away. But I would try one last thing and see how much influence you can have with that. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. And we have a question from Jennifer, and she says, how would this work in change for a larger group? And I am assuming she means what you just covered. Ah, okay. So for a larger group, Jennifer, and we, you saw the logos, we work with some enormous companies, and we work with some little tiny companies. If we look at a larger group, um, first we want to find out who the key influencers are. Every tribe, every tribe has key influencers. We want to enroll and engage the key influencers first. Be not fooled. The key influencers are not necessarily people in certain positions of power. Sometimes at a lot of our clients, the receptionist, right, the first point of contact, the person who answers the phone can be a very powerful tribal influencer. So look at the people that are the key influencers and, my friend, look at the people who are the naysayers, and this applies to Alex as well. The naysayers and the influencers, you're going to need to enroll and engage those people first, and it's going to ripple from there. When one of our clients came to us and said, we have 5,000 people in Critter State that we need for you to turn around, we said, okay, who do they report to? And then who do they report to? And then who do they report to? <laughs> and we did two things. We started at the top of the org chart, and, and, and we went down to the tribal leaders in the trenches. We did a two-pronged two approach, top down and bottom up. And when the, the naysayers at the top started to see better and better and better results in the trenches, they were like, whoa, this stuff actually works. So back to Alex as well. We're going to need to get some quick wins, Alex. We're going to show you a way to get a quick win in just a minute. But we need to get some quick wins. Jennifer, what's a quick win that you can carve off? It's going to be leadership, culture, or sales and marketing. Those are the things that people pay attention to. Alex, what's a quick win you can get? We'll show you the SBM index in a second, which is a great quick win. So find those influencers. Use meta programs and safety belonging mattering. Again, meta programs, chapter seven in both of our books, Smart Tribes and Power Your Tribe. Safety belonging and mattering, chapter two in both of our books, Power Your Tribe and um, Smart tribes. Do we have one more, uh, Alexis, or should I scooch? I would, um, I would go forward, and we'll catch some more questions at the end if we if okay. needed. Yes. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for all these great questions. Okay. Here's our last tool. Building on to helping people focus on outcomes. Building on to helping people consent and stop resisting so that they can focus on outcomes. We have to know what that person craves. Good old Maslow. Maslow was right. All of the different, and if you look at all of the research, even the recent, the recent Facebook stuff, the recent um, Google research, the SCARF model, self-determinism, um, it doesn't matter. All of that boils down, in my experience, to safety, belonging, and mattering. Safety, security, freedom from fear. Belonging, knowing we fit in, we have equal value, we're part of something. It's our tribe. Mattering, being acknowledged and appreciated for our unique gifts. So. Um, everybody who's working on influencing people and running engaging people, pay extra attention to this. If somebody has the behavior, if they're in critter state and they have the behavioral clues of gossip, rumors, spreading fear, talking about pain, disaster, hurt, um, planning their exit, fighting back, saying they're frozen, they can't move forward, chances are really good. They're simply craving safety. 
how you can help, talk with them about their concerns, provide contingency plans, talk about dependencies, normalize their experience. Don't go, don't ever resist somebody's experience, okay? If someone says, I'm really scared, say, wow, that must be hard, you know? How can I help? So don't ever tell somebody to not experience what they're experiencing. So when we have somebody who's, who's craving safety, we're gonna to need to give them the experience of safety. Yeah, let's sit down, I've got your back, we're in this together, let's unpack what we need to do to get the result we want. Together is a very powerful word. Belonging, isolating, withholding information, dropping out of context or contact, forming silos, talking about how you know, they're on their own, that's somebody who's in critter state who is creating belonging. You can tell them how happy you are you're on the team, they're on the team, ask them our, their ideas, bring them into the fold. People separate out because they feel that they don't belong. It's not their tribe. So as you guys look at people you need to enroll and engage, look at what they're craving. Mattering, condescension, arrogance, shutting others out. The guy who sent that email, he was just in critter state asking for some mattering. You know, we didn't need to get tied up in nuts about it. It was, it was his experience. He was just projecting his experience. The vast majority of the time when somebody sends you something that seems mean, they're just in critter state projecting their experience. You don't have to catch it and embody it yourself. You can just go, wow, that must be hard. Um, when somebody's overly self-focused, talking about how they're not appreciated, they're craving mattering. Call out their strengths. Have them lead a key initiative. Talk to them about how you can help them shine. So let's look at this for just a sec. Fight, flight, freeze, type into chat. If somebody has the behavior of fight, flight, freeze, what do you think they're craving? Yeah, safety. What about if they have us versus them? There's us, there's them. There's the executives and there's the people who actually do the work here. If they're having that experience, yeah, good, belonging. How about perpetually seeking recognition? But I, but I did all this good stuff and I did that good stuff. What are we craving here? Safety, belonging, mattering? Yeah, mattering, good. Victim complaining, whining. I'm not being seen, appreciated, acknowledged, valued. What are they craving? Yeah, good. Mattering, possibly some other stuff. Procrastinating, what are they craving? Safety, belonging, mattering? Yeah, combination. Yep, combo pack. So let's look at one other thing. I want you guys to, here's some homework for you. Pick a stakeholder in your business. This is especially important for everybody who's asked questions. What do they crave most from their interaction with you? How do you know? What could you give them? What could you tell them instead? And Empower Your Tribe would go through tons of different messages that you could give them. All right, I want you guys to do this as homework. We're gonna do one quick cultural lab. When we have benefits programs, when we're a corporation that has benefits programs, what, what experience does that create? Safety, belonging, mattering? Yeah, good, safety. Type into chat, tribal rituals, celebrations, things where people come together. What, do we, what experience do we get there? Yeah, belonging. We're doing stuff together. Good, good, good. You guys are getting this. Recognition programs, rock stars, high fives, where we're seen and acknowledged and appreciated. Yeah, good. Mattering, good. How about individual development plans? We're cultivating your career. Here's how you're gonna grow. Um, here's your career path. Yeah, good, mattering plus. And then thoughtful, value-based onboarding processes. What experience does that give? Yeah, combo pack. So now let's look. Tool number three is actually figuring out the emotional experience of our culture because that's gonna help us understand why we have resistance, where we have resistance, and where we need to focus on outcomes more. This ties everything up in a bow. When we do, we call these SBM index, Safety, Belonging, Mattering Index, and we present them at a heat map format, right? Because you look at this and you go, wow, the investments department has some challenges. Wow, everybody's cool in marketing, except they wouldn't want their friends to work here. Ah, because they don't get acknowledgement and appreciation, line number 15. We start to understand the emotional experience of our people. We do urge you to do this by department and then look to the far right, the roll up of the whole company. And we notice what's lowest, right? At this company, belonging is the lowest. And then mattering comes next. This is on a scale of 100%. So they have some work to do. 
and then next is safety. We have to talk to, of course, and do some executive coaching for the investments leader. We probably need to do some investment coaching, well, for sure, for the CEO overall. But I think we also need to do some coaching for the executive team overall in a couple of areas because if collectively we have numbers that are this low, there are some problems in the culture that probably everybody is contributing to. So reach out to us if you want to help doing an SBM index. It's a great way to do a quick win. So let's look at this for a sec. We get these answers. We run the survey, we get these answers, then what do we do? Then we create what we call a cultural game plan. Growth, appreciation, measurement, engagement. So when we do culture coaching and we create this cultural game plan based on the SBM index results, then we start to see people getting more engaged, people feeling more safe, taking more risks, being more innovative, people feeling that they belong more, sharing more information, more collaboration, more teamwork, more helping each other out, feeling that they matter more, people striving to make a bigger difference, people helping lift up and elevate others and cultivate others. A cultural game plan is not a quick one-off cultural game plan, you're going to want to lay it out for about a year. After programs have been put in place and have been in place for a few months, we, we don't recommend doing another SBM index for at least six months in the beginning. You get the plans in place, you roll out the programs, you get good executive support and leadership support, boom. Then when you rerun your SBM index, you see much higher scores. What's the result? Greater retention faster recruiting, um, happier people, and again, all the good stuff I mentioned, more teamwork, et cetera. So we want deeper connections. We want more trust. Our tools provide, according to Mark Benioff, a, a proven playbook for increasing engagement alignment results. We've shared three tools with you today. We're gonna do a couple of quick questions, but I'm gonna show you guys the summary as we do our quick questions. Release resistance via reframing right? Choose the meaning you want to make. Create a compelling outcome so everybody's excited to move forward. Safety, belonging, mattering, we've got to know what the emotional undertone is. If we don't know what the undertone is, it's going to be an undertow, okay? The SPM index and the game plan diagnose where the trouble is, help us release that change resistance, and actually help us transform stress or disengagement into power, okay? So we'll take a couple of questions while we're looking at what we wanna do next. So if you, if you look at these tools and you go, you know what, we actually need to do something here. We need some coaching, we need to do a training, a workshop, we need to do one of those quick wins that Christine mentioned. Go ahead and request a strategy session, smarttribesinstitute.com slash strategy. Or if you just have kind of a big open question, you can go ahead and email ops at smarttribesinstitute.com. We also, of course, have a contact form on our website, whatever's easier for you, but this will save you guys some time. Um, yes, we will be sharing the slides after today's webinar. We'll share the slides and we'll share the recording, okay? Great, let's take any final question and um, or question or two from everybody. Take it away, Alexis. Wonderful. So we have a question from Janet. Janet says, my team feels like second class citizens after being, uh, you know, acquired in a, mer in a merger. I actually don't disagree with them. What would you suggest as a next step to empower myself so I can empower them? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Janet, this is where leadership coaching and culture coaching would come in handy. But for now, um, and feel free to go to our site and, and request a one-off session on this. Um, it sounds like belonging is low, and it sounds like mattering is low as well. So what mattering and belonging can you create within your team? First, let's get them feeling that they matter, so acknowledging, appreciating, high fives, et cetera, um, special projects you can put them on helping pull everybody together and giving them the experience of being a tight-knit tribe. Um, then we get those great results within our own team and then we're gracious and we share it to everybody else. 
and we say, wow, I really want to acknowledge people outside your area. I really want to acknowledge blah, 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 and blah, blah for helping our team create these amazing results. So yes, this is like the assumptive close. You are saying that these other people outside of your tribe belonged with you and helped you matter. So you're going to go out as wide as you can, and you're going to be gracious and acknowledge all these people that are not in your tribe for helping your tribe succeed. Make sure that you forward this tribe success to the whole company. We want your team to become the poster children of belonging and mattering. And then other leaders are going to be asking, what are you doing? How are you doing that? We need to create deep belonging and mattering with our own tribe first, and then reach out to some of those, back to those influencers, reach out to some of the cultural and tribal leaders outside of our team, involve them in our projects, or even just say, I really see you as a thought leader. Could I bounce a couple ideas off you? We're doing such and such special project. What would you recommend? You could have 10 minute conversations with these outside tribal leaders, and then you can acknowledge them when your team succeeds. We need to start you messaging that you belong. And I want you to start to look at how you guys are messaging things differently now, because you may be messaging that you don't belong. And I want you to message assumptively that you do belong, okay? It's sophisticated, okay? It is making new meaning. Because if you stop to look at the people you don't think you belong with, and look at what you have common, in common, we call it three-minute journaling. We talk about it in Power Your Tribe. List all the ways that you actually are similar to them. Maybe you both have kids. Maybe you both like to work out. Maybe you both like to eat healthy food. We need to actually start to look at how we actually do belong with others beyond the superficial ways we think we don't. Okay. Good luck. Great. We have a question from Rhonda. Rhonda's question is, how can you help a CEO who is very risk adverse? Okay, Rhonda, take a sec. A CEO who is very risk averse, what emotional experience is that CEO craving, please? Safety, belonging, mattering? Thank you, safety, good. <laughs> All right, so we have a CEO who is craving safety, great. Um, how can we show the CEO that, frankly, in my experience, change is going to happen regardless. The world's going to keep moving faster and faster and faster. The only safe path is to be change agile. So think about the specific areas, feel free to type them into chat, where this CEO wants to feel safe. And then we're going to tie those areas. This is an anchor. For those of you who haven't read Smart Tribes or Power Your Tribe yet, please read the chapter on anchoring. Very, very important. We need to anchor the areas where this person wants safety to the experience of safety. It is a beautiful, beautiful tool. So to become safe, I need to revise our revenue model. To become safe, I need to, oh, thank you. I need to communicate this sort of stuff to my board. Hey, board of directors, the world is moving faster and faster and faster. Change is inevitable and constant. Thus, we are going to launch these initiatives to ensure that we have predictable revenue, to ensure that we have profitable growth, to ensure that we have high retention of our people. Here are these proven tools, techniques from over a thousand companies, if you're going to use our tools. And here's what we have learned about our company. Rhonda, I would love for you to run an SBM index. Your, I'm curious about other areas where your CEO isn't feeling safe. If he's not feel, or she is not feeling safe with their board, oh, you said his board. If he's not feeling safe with his board, how specifically? Does he think he might be fired? Has he brought them a lot of bad news? What specifically does he need to do that you are then going to attach yourself to him and help him create that experience of safety with his board? Is it communicating results? It's either uh, people, money, or model. Which one is it? Is it feeling not, that like your culture is not strong, uh, your leadership's not strong, too high of turnover, et cetera? Afraid to lose faith, not sure why he's viewed as very risk averse. Okay, but here's the thing. 
the more risk averse he's viewed as, the less job security he has. The more risk averse in a world like this, the less job security you have. The greater ability to pivot. So he's afraid to lose face. He also wants mattering. Let's help him figure out how he can get mattering and safety with his board. I actually think he might want mattering first and safety might be the byproduct. So what results do we need to show the board so he can shine and get mattering, okay? Perhaps more data-driven outcome picturing, thank you. Yeah, I would sit down with him and I would say, hey, I'm really thinking about how we can thrill the board, you know, for instance. You know, what would we like there? You could do an outcome frame with him. You know, what would really make the board um, appreciate it, us, acknowledge us, give us more freedom, give us whatever we want from the board? And then do an outcome frame, and then maybe we need to do an SBM index, et cetera, okay? Yeah, I really, I, I really feel like this is mattering first, because if it doesn't matter, he's totally not safe, okay? So please read Smart Tribes, uh, the Safety Blind and Mattering section, Chapter 2. Look at Power Your Tribe, Safety Blind and Mattering section. Go to our website, grab a strategy session, grab a one-off coaching call. But please do your homework first and find out specifically what he wants, and then we're going to tie He's going to get that emotional experience, and you're going to be the bringer of that, which is a beautiful thing. You guys, um, we have to end. Um, Alexis, um, I think we're on our way. We are at the end. Um, we do have a question from Lauren. Um, Christine, you can decide if you want to answer that here or if you want to answer, have me answer that via email. Um, I'll answer it quick like a bunny. If, if people need to leave, we totally get that. Um, reach out to us in whichever way is going to be more helpful to follow through with us, and we're going to send you the replay and the slides. The replay one and the slides. Question. One more question Lauren. from Lauren. Yeah. <laughs> what, Ready, do you, Lauren? What, what do you recommend for integrating changes that will help some team members feel the safety, belonging, or mattering they need without throwing another area off? Example, better systems and structures to create safety, missing for a few team members may inadvertently make other team members feel they don't belong if their role changes. Okay, let me see if I get that. Um, what I would say here, Lauren, is that um, the welfare of the many is more important than the welfare of the individuals. If we have, again, if we run an SBM index and we find that people really don't have the resources to do their job or they need more systems or structures, that's probably either it's a leadership challenge in that particular department or, or there's a system structure problem throughout, but it just hasn't shown up yet. So whatever we do for a given department, if other departments are good, and you'll know from the SBM index, um, then either you're going to be strengthening this area of the company so that the company collectively can benefit. Sometimes um, the body is doing well, right? But the uh, ankle is sore, you know? And we work on fixing the ankle so the body can function wholly. So as long as we do it as a belonging message and a mattering message, hey, so, so that we all can achieve this greatest good, we will be helping to strengthen the systems in the finance department since it's ultimately going to benefit all of us. As you guys see the improvements in finance and you realize that you might need some process or structural improvements in your area, please let us know. We would love to share our best practices with you. We'll create standard operating procedures and best practices for business process optimization so we all can be as efficient as we want to be because we're all in this together and the success of, of each team uh, fulfills the success of the organization overall. Okay, I know we have to go. We <laughs> promised we would end on time. We did. So thank you everyone for joining us and we will send the replay and the slides within 24 hours. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for being with us today. Take good care. <laughs>